hi everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Gupta, and as mentioned, uh, I'm the founder of Boston Augmented Reality. It's a nonprofit augmented reality accelerator, and the mission is to build the frontier ecosystem in Boston. We do this by organizing meetups and hackathons. Uh, we partner on conferences like these, and we work with uh, startups, advisors, or as advisors, uh, as well as founders and entrepreneurs to help them create their own applications in the space. Today, I'm going to be thinking about design thinking for augmented reality and how you can think about making products not only for augmented reality, but with the entire suite of frontier technology at your fingertips, how do you not get overwhelmed by what's possible and actually make something your consumers will enjoy? Perfect, thank you very much, perfect timing. So what is design thinking? What this really means is thinking about your product or your service or your offering or what have you from the user's perspective. And while this might seem obvious, it's actually been something that people haven't really focused on for a while, and that's what Apple really brought into everyone's mindset is this is how you make real products, not just a suite of technology that you've put a package around. And the reason why it's different for augmented reality is that this is now gonna be the most intimate interface that any of us have experienced. In its current form, it sits on your face with light being projected directly into your eyeballs. As you heard from some of the other talks today, Augmented reality will start to take other forms where it uh, communicates over other sensory modalities, whether that's your audio channel, haptics that you can feel. There's a startup in Cambridge that's working on wrist-worn devices that can make you feel the sensation of hot or cold, which could be another way of signaling information to someone. So across your senses, design thinking is gonna become more and more important. So I wanna start off with a, a quote from a well-known fellow. Uh, most people make the mistake of thinking design is what it looks like, the rounded corners, the color at the end, things like that. Steve Jobs said, design is how it works. I think there's actually two elements to that last bit of design is how it works that I wanna go into, which is design is how something should work, and it's also understanding how the user is going to use it. And a good designer will actually merge those together, so how a product is used is actually how you design it to work. The larger that distance, the more you have work to do to understand your customer's needs or their use case or whatever it might be. So on that point, thinking about your user. A uh, professor at UVA said that human-centered innovation, which is design thinking, which is human-centered engineering, all of these really mean thinking about your user first. It begins with developing understanding of your user's needs. So the onus is on you. You have to do the work. You have to figure out what your user might want to do with a product. If you give them a product that is a suite of capabilities without saying here's the specific thing it does, you're asking the user right away to do something. You're giving them a suitcase full of clothes and say, well, where do you want to go? as opposed to saying, this is packed for Hawaii. You can go to Hawaii. So if you're giving more work to your user, you're not really implementing design thinking. You're very obsessed with the technology, usually. You're coming from a tech push approach where you're saying, this is so cool. There's so much we can do with it. What do you want to do with it? Well, again, that's your job as a designer. And I think as a little side note, nowadays people are starting to conflate the terms engineer, developer, designer, because people want to be you know, sort of a renaissance uh, person and, and be all of those things at once. That's okay, but they're very different. So recognize the usefulness of designers, especially in this role. Uh, last quote, and I'm gonna try to make this a short presentation. I know it's towards the end of the day. Uh, but the VP of design at Airbnb has a great quote I love. You need to bring your tool forward when it's most needed and hide it when it's not. What this really is referring to is context. And with augmented reality, we have a better sense of the user's context than we ever had before. So I wanna break context into three factors. When you're talking about information, there's what information we should display to a user, there's when we should display it to them, and then how we should display it to them. These three things are dictated by context. So let's take a simple example of giving someone directions. Maybe you're driving in a car, um, and the next direction is you're supposed to take a left. That's the what. When do we give you this information? We can't give it to you right when you're supposed to take a left, it's too late. If we give it to you too far in advance, you sort of have to cue it in your cognitive you know, framework and it's only gonna add more and more cognitive load, as they call it, to the user. That's poor design. So at the right time, and that's based on context of the GPS of the car or the phone or what have you. The final question is how to deliver this information, over what modality. Maybe you're in the car and it's very noisy, so just saying take a left isn't the best way to do it. Maybe it's uh, better to have it in a heads-up display. Maybe it's those wrist-worn devices that, hey, when you feel hot on your wrist, you know you're supposed to take your next left. So again, we understand context so much more, we can make the tools appear and disappear as they need to. What this starts to get into when you mix this with understanding the user even more is you can become uh, dynamic with your context. You can change as the context changes, and now that products are alive with connected devices, 
you're always recognizing the context in which someone is using your device, or you should be designing devices with that in mind. This enables two things that are very important, and if you take maybe two things away from this talk, it's these. One is this concept of dynamic design, that you're constantly changing your design because it's live and in the field, so you can update it as you better understand your user's needs, and that comes from context. So you can get constant context that enables dynamic design. That was, that was the sentence for the takeaway from this talk. Um, and, and one thing that's kind of interesting is when you think about interfaces, which is how you're actually using this information, that too can change based on the context. So if a user is very tired, maybe you only want to show them the most obvious information. If a user is um, you know, uh, in a certain situation that you can measure, you can make the, the interface different. So not just the information, but how you access that information can be different. So what I want to do with the final slide that I'm going to show you is roll these ideas into kind of a framework for how to evaluate products that are out there and how you can think about making products moving forward. So oh, what you, oh, that's too bad. What you can't really see here is at the top, there's supposed to be a blue triangle sort of pointing down and outwards. And at the bottom, there's a green triangle sort of pointing up. And what I'm trying to say there is there's two approaches to rolling products out. The blue is supposed to be sort of a top-down approach. Typically, that's a tech push approach where you're so in love and so enamored with the technology that you've forgotten to think about the user. The bottoms up approach on the bottom is quite the opposite. So let's take a few examples here. Google Glass, the thing that everybody loves to hate, that was primarily a tech push. They said augmented reality is so cool, there's so much you can do with it, here you go. They didn't deliver a product. They delivered a suite of capabilities and asked the user to figure out what to do with it. And yes, now Google Glass has found a little bit more of a home in medical applications and maybe a few other places, but they had to first ask people to tell them that. It's not the way you design good products. The bottoms up approach comes from Snapchat. You could argue that the Snap Spectacles aren't even augmented reality glasses. They're sunglasses that have cameras on them. But that's what the bottoms up approach is. And when you go back to Alex's quote about the tool only being there when you need it, they have dictated by making them sunglasses, not glasses, when you should be using it, and they understand the user, what they want to do, and how they can give that to them. Now what they can do, when you think about that dynamic design and iterative con or um, constant context, you can understand, okay, do users want to be able to take photos? Right now you can take 10 to 20 seconds of video. If they want to be able to take photos, that's the next thing we can roll out with this dynamic design. If they want to be able to live stream what they see to someone else, maybe that's a different product. What if they want to put filters on everything they're seeing? Okay, that's a completely different hardware product with a different set of engineering specs, but before you roll that out, understand that's actually what your users are asking for, or it's one of their unmet and unarticulated needs that you have somehow discovered. Another great example is the HoloLens. Now, kudos to Microsoft, it's a developer kit, so you know, what I'm primarily talking about is selling to consumers. Developers are a different brand or a different animal altogether because you really can give them a suite of capabilities and say, you turn this into a product. So the HoloLens is not, with the parlance I'm coming up with, not really a product in and of itself. It's a suite of capabilities, and developers have turned the apps into various products and things like that. However, the bottoms-up approach again, we'll go to Snapchat, not even on the, on the um, glasses, but on the phone. They really limited what you could do with augmented reality to a specific use case they knew people would be interested in, and now they can continue to expand it with their world lens and whatever else they might add to it. The final example I'll give, which is my favorite one, is the Google Home device, this really tried to sell you as an in-home assistant. They, they sold you on the, the promise of artificial intelligence. And if you think of the Gartner hype cycle, that's at the peak of inflated expectations. And that's what all of these top-down approach products do. They sell you on the peak of inflated expectations, and the only place for you to go is in that trough of disappointment. Now for users, for consumers, they feel the pain of loss at least twice as much as they feel the joy of winning something. So yes, maybe they'll come back up to a plateau. So with Google Glass, okay, the medical community is the one that uses it. But no one remembers that plateau. They remember that deep dive they took. When you start here, you're not really selling the, the technology. You're selling a product. You're selling a use case. You're selling something that the consumer can wrap their mind around. So again, the Google Home was sold as this in-home assistant. Well, there's a lot of things it can't do. So when you go from a top-down approach, you disappoint your customers by design because they're going to be looking for it to do everything you promised, and it simply cannot. When you go from a bottoms-up approach, you delight your customers, and instead of having complaints about what it can't do, how it falls short of promise, you have wishes. Oh, I wish it could also do this. So you constantly have opportunities to delight your customer base as opposed to let them down and disappoint them. So Amazon did this perfectly. This is, in my opinion, one of the most perfect product rollouts that's ever occurred. 
This is the same thing. As far as functionality, it's the same thing as a Google Home. But they didn't say it's an assistant. They said it's a speaker. It's a voice-controlled speaker. It does one thing for you. Oh, yeah, and you can ask it what time it is, and you can ask it a few other questions. But they didn't talk about that. They didn't stress it. As the market has become more informed, and as people realize, hey, there's actually a lot more that this can do, they're rolling out more skills. They're creating a developer environment. They understand how to make a product as opposed to a suite of technology. One more example I'll give, and I'll kind of leave this as something for you all to think about, is a new sort of technology that's coming out is projected augmented reality. So instead of wearing glasses, what if all the light bulbs in here could show me information? Well, what I've just described is a suite of capabilities because I could use that information to make a virtual chessboard right here, or I could have instructions for how to walk through the, through the house, or I could have any number of things. So how can you think of either a top-down approach to that for developers or a bottoms-up approach for consumers? How would you go about understanding what it is they want with all the new tools that are out there for understanding your user, for understanding the context? I implore you all to think of the bottoms-up approach whenever you can. Thank you very much.